pool. But who's going to write that story? And who's going to publish it? And who's going to read it? I mean, it's really offensive. Don't tell me that Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund is a problem or that Jane Goodall, Jane Goodall is a problem because National Geographic for the last 50 years has told me that Jane Goodall is my heroine. And so she, she is. And I don't want to hear the story about how the Jane Goodall Institute is actually arming the militias in eastern Congo to make sure that they protect the Kahuzi Bagan National Park, or in this case, the, uh, the, the, the new parks created up around an area called Wali Keli. And if you want to know about an area named Wali Keli, there's a guy in the audience who can really give us some interesting information about it tonight. Anyway, the African Wildlife Foundation. Let's pick them, for example. And Kigali, Rwanda, operate. Guerrilla tourism is their biggest, one of their biggest sectors. Plundering the Congo is their biggest. Guerrilla tourism is their big, next, one of their next biggest. Anybody who flies into Rwanda today is supporting genocide by going to see the guerrillas. But they don't know that. You know, and that's where that innocence subject comes in re with respect to James Baldwin. But let's go back to the African Wildlife Foundation. It's just a big wildlife foundation. They care about elephants. Well, I've got to support that. Send them 20 bucks. Well, it turns out the directors include a guy named Walter Kansteiner, National Security Council under William Jefferson Clinton in 1996 and 1997 at the time of the invasion of the Congo. Turns out Walter Kansteiner has got this secretive conservation organization in Washington, D.C., and they're funneling funds into Congo and Uganda and Rwanda, but we don't quite know what they're funneling funds in there for. The African Wildlife Foundation... Walter Kansiner, turns out, National Security Council, remember, is also on the board of directors of a little company called Moto Gold, which happens to have one of the biggest new gold operations connected to that place called Kilo Moto. But nobody's ever reported that. Nobody's ever reported that Walter Kansiner is connected to Moto Gold. Who's Moto Gold? Nobody's ever reported Moto Gold. They're not in the Congo. What's Congo? Congo's a bunch of Africans slaughtering Africans. It's a bunch of women being raped by those savage African mil militias. Who are those African militias? In the Congo, they're the FDLR. The FDLR committed genocide in Rwanda, and then they marched into Congo to escape their crimes. This is the narrative. And, and started brutal, brutalizing people in the eastern Congo, which is over here. Well, step back in time a little bit further again, and we find that these, uh, these are the logging concessions designated to the international so-called community, which would be the Blattner family, the Forrest family from Belgium. Uh, Big logging companies in some cases, like Weyerhaeuser. But this is during Mobutu's era. So this map was 1982. Look at the Congo is as big from uh, basically from Massachusetts to the Ohio River in this direction and from Maine to somewhere around Maryland or, or Virginia or North Carolina in that direction. It's a pretty big section of the United States if we mapped it over the United States. So you, you can imagine all that logging. That's the Congolese rainforest, and it's, it's literally being destroyed. But it began long ago under the Belgian colonial occupation, and then post-Belgian colonial occupation, during the reign of Mobutu, all these concessions were given out to these Americans, Belgians, French, Australians in some cases. But we don't get this kind of map out of the media. All we get is this savagery in Congo. This could very well be one of the bridges that the, that the Rwandan Hutu people were forced to run across as fast as they could, running for their lives from the, the war in Rwanda. Mobutu kept the eastern of the Congo undeveloped because he didn't want an invasion to come in from the eastern Congo. Eastern Congo was very far from uh, Kinshasa, where Mobutu had his, his, one of his bases. He had another base up in Gabadolite in the north where he was from, and he had another palace in Lisala. But his biggest, safest place to be in the Congo was on the Congo River on a yacht. It's more like a barge. And some of the people that protected him were Mossad agents and Belgians and uh, there's a Belgian guy that still runs the Congo River. You find these guys mentioned sometimes in stories like the one by Brian Mueller, a uh, New York Times writer, reporter, who published Those Things That Fight to Fight to Survive, or something like that. All Things Must Fight to Live. He mentions this guy who runs this barge up and down the Congo in 2006 or whatever. And he doesn't tell you that the guy was one of Mobutu's former chief security operatives. But you do a little bit of more research, you find out that's where the guy came from. He's not just some innocent guy who survived the war in the Congo, like Brian Mueller tells you. So all things from must fight to live doesn't give you the history, doesn't give you the background, doesn't give you any of the relevant facts. And the guy virtually wins a Pulitzer Prize for it. The bridges in the eastern Congo, you see my bicycle down there. This was 1990, 1990 and uh, 1991. And I had come in from Kenya. I rode across Uganda. I didn't know that there was a war going on in Rwanda at the time and rode into the Congo on my bicycle, and I'm trying to get a, help these guys get across the bridge. The, what they do is they take the boards from behind the truck, move them in the front, drive a few feet, move the boards from the front, drive a few feet, and they make their way across this bridge. 
these rivers are sometimes infested with, you know, crocodiles and some of the refugees who escaped from Rwanda had to drown, swim across, be eaten by crocodiles as they were chased by the Rwandan Patriotic Front. Mobutu kept the eastern Congo undeveloped like this. There were no roads built. The roads that did exist were mud holes when it rained. And it stopped commerce at one, on one level, but it, it impeded an invasion on another. There was commerce coming in. The Eastern Congo is a very, very powerful commercial center for the world at this point because of the raw materials coming out of there and because of the power of Rwanda and Uganda as America's primary military bases on the African continent, especially Rwanda. Tiny little island country. You have to ask, why would the United States be interested in overthrowing the government of Rwanda in 1990? And the answer is because it provides this neat little mountainous country which turns out to be at this point in a very powerful American military base, basically. There's several bases that have been built, but it is an American military protectorate. And they're sending troops from, if I said this already, I'm going to say it again, they're sending troops from Uganda and Rwanda through Africa, on the, the Pentagon's Africa Command, to Iraq and Afghanistan. This is Kinshasa. You see the Mercedes-Benz. Well, the Mercedes-Benz has always been used as a symbol by the American media of the corruption of the Mobutu regime. What they don't talk about is the corruption of Citibank. They don't talk about the corruption of Chase Manhattan Bank, how they supported Mobutu for all these years. They supported Mobutu's arming of those troops that were sent in whenever students protest or whenever women took off all their clothes in protest to the brutalization of the dictatorship and then were brutalized by the dictatorship. But that was their form of protest. They would take off all their clothes and walk down the streets as mothers. We are mothers of this country. It was very, very, very powerful. And most of the heroes were killed, jailed, silenced in one way or another. But there are still some survivors out there who will tell the story. The plantations in the heart of the Congo big, big business by the and, the, and the logging companies, big, big business by the late 1980s, supporting Mobutu, working with Mobutu. So these are the people behind Mobutu. Whenever the media talks about Mobutu today, they talk about how Mobutu plundered the country and filled up the Swiss bank accounts as if he was the only guy involved and as if it was all an African affair. Mobutu was the front man. He was the fall guy. When somebody goes down, there has to be a fall guy. In this case, Mobutu went down. They were done with him. They had to replace him because... By 1996, after 40 years of Mobutu, the Congo was this amazingly well-conserved or preserved country of raw materials, which had barely begun to be plundered, even though it had been plundered phenomenally, and the people had been you know, brutalized for years and years and years, meaning decades and decades and decades. If you can get a caterpillar or whatever it is like that into Isangi on the Lomami River, in the middle of Congo, you can get basic education into the Congo. If you can get those, this kind of equipment in there and get those $15,000 logs, each log you see in that picture is a $15,000 log. If you can get those out, you can get basic health care in there. So this is structural violence by design. It's not an accident that Africans are poor. It's not an accident that they don't have access to raw materials to, uh, to basic health care, basic education. In the Sudan, the missionaries will send in Bibles where people are starving to death and then hold Bible ceremonies where the people are starving to death. I mean, the people are literally falling over while they're reading the Bible, praying to God. Why can't you send in food? What is the missionary organization really about? <clears throat> Here you see the Congo River in Bendaka, and you see the quality of life for the average person in the pirogue, the basic, you know, this is what the average person uses to get up and down the river. And in the back, you've got more of the dilapidated infrastructure. And the point is that you've got plunder on one hand, you've got an economy of plunder, an economy of power, an economy of white supremacy, and on the other hand, you've got an economy of exploitation, an economy of suffering. One cannot exist without the other. They exist together. The raw materials, the labor from the economy of suffering provide for the economy of power. And those logs, as I said, are $15,000 a piece logs. They come out, they're coming out at a phenomenal rate being shipped to Korea, Japan, the United States, Belgium, France, etc., etc. Thailand stripped all their logs, their, their forests years ago, so they're buying logs out of the Congo. Who's making all the money? George Samja. George Samja has nice clothing, brand new glasses. He flies in and out of Belgium whenever he wants. He's got a brand new four-wheel drive. He's got five brand new four-wheel drives. And he's got his nephew who comes in to help him when he needs to. He's got everything he wants. He promised the people in this village a school ten years ago. Meaning, I was there in 2005, he had promised them a school in 1995. The school hadn't even been started, and he was still telling them, well, I'm going to build your school. The people knew that this wasn't going to happen, but what do you do? 
because George Sanja has the power of the Congolese military behind him. Another guy, a really interesting guy, is this, uh, I'm skipping his name for the moment, but he runs this country called, this company called Belgo Congo, which is just behind that little fence there. It's a, it's a small automobile and, and vehicle repair, mechanic service, but he also owns vast plantations around Kisangani. This is Kisangani in the heart of the Congo. And you see that this poor guy is just absolutely, you know, trying to earn two bucks pushing cassava leaves on an old beat up bicycle or charcoal or whatever it is. If he earn, you know, he'll earn a buck, maybe a buck, working all day long. Maybe it takes him a week to make a buck. Because on those plantations where he we went, they were making a dollar a week. No, it was a dollar, it was 500 francs. Um, it was, I better check that information because it wasn't a day. And I think it was more than a week. In any case, it's not much money, and it's a lot of suffering. But the guy that runs this Belgo Con Congo has a lot of plantations around Kisangani, and he was contracted by AFRICOM, meaning the Pentagon, to build the first base for AFRICOM in Kisangani, which has been built now in the last year, in Kisangani. And uh, he didn't bid on that. He was just given the contract. It's total corruption. And this guy, is, uh, he's French, he's a French and... Uh, French and Belgian man background, I think. And his bulldozers and his, his power equipment was used to bury the refugees that didn't survive in the, in the Kisangani region when they were all massacred back in 1996-97. The RPF, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, meaning the president of Rwanda sent his people in, the RPF, and uh, I think Kagame was nearby, the president, and Museveni from Uganda sent their people in and, and uh, chased these refugees across the region. So here's Uganda, and here's tiny little Rwanda and Burundi, and Kisangani is somewhere uh, the bend in the river. I think it's here. What? Up here. Anyway, it's in there. And the point is that um, it's very deep in the Congo. And they can get their raw materials in and out, and they ship their raw materials.